Hello, I'm Martin Farr, co-chair of Insights Public Lectures. Welcome to the latest in our autumn program, an online virtual series. Our first lecture was on Tuesday, where Shahida Bari gave a wonderful lecture on dress, which has been watched already over 2000 times, which is wonderful. Uh, you can see past lectures on our YouTube channel and also on the Insights website, where we've got lots of archive lectures and lots of content we created in the summer. The evening's lecture, uh, we welcome back one of our former students who've gone on to great things, uh, Professor Danny Dorling, who'll be speaking on slow down, the end of the great acceleration and why it's good for the planet, the economy and our lives. I'll be back at about six o'clock after the lecture to field a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question of our speaker, you have two ways to submit them. One is the chat box on the YouTube screen in front of you. The other is an, on our Twitter handle, which is at Insights NCL, at Insights NCL. I'll be happy to pose your questions to Danny at the end of his lecture. To introduce today's lecture, we have Ted Schrecker, who is Professor of Global Health Policy here at Newcastle. Good evening. My name is Ted Schrecker. I'm Professor of Global Health Policy here at Newcastle University. And as you can probably tell, I'm not from around here. I came to the UK from Canada seven years ago and have quite settled in even though as a political scientist, I occasionally wonder how I ended up in a faculty of medical science. I suspect some of my colleagues wonder the same thing. The only thing more dreary than a long introduction is a long recorded introduction, so I'll be brief. Well before moving here, I was reading Danny Dorling's inspiring and data-rich work on inequality on multiple scales. I was first introduced to his work by way of the remarkable World Mapper project, but he's done extensive work on inequalities within the UK and on an even smaller scale as well. And I think it's fair to say that Professor Dorling, more than any other single researcher, has put the issue of inequality on the map, as it were. I do feel compelled to note that he is a Newcastle alumnus, and since 2013, he has been the Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography at Oxford's School of Geography and the Environment, having moved there from Sheffield. If I were even to try to list his major achievements and publications, I would take up all his time. You can find a rather intimidating list either at his Oxford webpage or at his personal website, dannydorling.org. I'll just say that some of us think of him as the Stephen King of critical geography in that he produces new books faster than we can read them. Check out those websites and you'll see what I mean. Danny, it is an honor and a delight to welcome you virtually to Tyneside and I hope that all of you viewing this enjoy the lecture as I'm sure you will. Hello, I'm Danny Dorling and I would like to talk to you about slow down and the end of the great acceleration. Uh, this is a talk about a book I've written. Uh, what you're seeing in the middle of the screen is the cover of the paperback edition of the book, which will be published early in 2021. The hardback came out uh, in spring of 2020 and was finished in January of 2020, before we had any idea of what was about uh, to befall us. Uh, the last changes to it were made, I think, about the 6th, 7th of January in 2020. So this isn't a book, this isn't a talk about the pandemic. Uh, this is a talk about processes which were under play long before the pandemic and will be under play almost certainly uh, long after it actually becomes part of our history and not something that has absorbed us so very much. The sandcastles I'll explain at the end. Here's some blurb uh, you can read about what I'm supposed to be trying to talk about if I remember what I have to say. But what I'm really going to do, you can read the blurb if you'd like to multi what I talk. What I'm really going to do is show you a series of slides, about 28, 29 slides, each of which is on a different topic or a different aspect of the same topic, and each of which is looking at the rate of change. And my argument is that in general, the rate of change has been 
falling over time. Um, we don't tend to think it has been falling. We're told that uh, our lives have never changed as fast as they're changing now. And even that now may appear to be fast, but the future, we'll look back at today and we'll think it was never as slow. This all sounds very convincing. Uh, you will tend to believe that the rate of change is very fast because people tell you fast and you may well feel stressed or if people tell you you should be feeling stressed and, and you may well believe them. The problem comes when you begin to measure the rate of change in various things. and Then you find that actually for many of our parents, our grandparents and certainly for our great grandparents, the rate of social change, the rate of innovation, the speed of things like the growth of the population, the increase in GDP, the change in forms of travel. All of that was actually faster for them than for us. And then what we do, and I hope you finish reading if you were wanting to read, then what we do is we desperately try to find something about our lives, often involving the internet or something we don't know much about, like nanotechnology or artificial intelligence, to say, but there's a great change going on in our lives. And that's natural, that's normal to do, but please think back Think back at least just in terms of your own family to your grandparents and think, if you're my age, when did they first pick up a telephone? When did they first see a moving picture in a cinema screen? When did the television first arrive for them? Were they old enough to have seen the first flight and then people land on the moon and see computers come and be widespread? And how on earth does that incredible range of experience and change over the course of their lives compare to the rather pedestrian rate of change that you've actually experienced in your life? Your grandparents, if you're very old, possibly uh, your parents, if you're young, it might be your great grandparents. They saw things that were predicted in science fiction happen in their lives. Whereas for my, for my generation, I'm afraid we're still waiting for Beam Me Up Scotty. Uh, the speed of airplanes has actually slowed down over the course of my lifetime. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm not talking about slow down here as being a terrible disaster that we should worry about. I just want us to, to step back and accept that there has been some slowing down. Now, here's the kind of evidence that we don't accept slowdown. We produce graphs like this one. This is world population. Over the last 12,000 years, hardly any change, and then suddenly this, this explosion out of, out of all proportion. And look at it, look at the very end, it's just going to take off. In fact, that graph looks like it's actually going to get up and reach the moon at the rate it's changing. Uh, these are the kind of images that school children in the UK are used to. Uh, they tend to be told that population growth in the planet is out of control. And if that's what you think is going on, then you'll be quite scared about what's happening. And you also think that things like the increased number of human beings on the planet are the source of many of our other problems. Uh, this is just the easiest example of something where the rate of change isn't now as fast as it was in the past. So what's a better way of looking at the rate of change? Well, a better way is actually to show the rate of change on the graph. And here on the horizontal axis, you've got the rate of change. And you can see that it's increasing. This is an imaginary country. It's a country that starts off with a population of 100 million in 1950. That population grows by 2% each year from 1950 onwards, which means that around about 1970, it's growing by ooh, almost 3 million people a year. But by ooh, the mid 1980s, it's growing by 4 million a year. And by the time you get to the year 2000, it's soon going to grow by 6 million a year. And it's reached 300 million people and it's out of control. Compound interest, 2% a year. By 2020, it's 400 million. That's acceleration. That kind of a pattern. It's a straight line on this graph. That kind of a pattern is what people mean by out of control growth. Uh, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin talked about this. And I've, I've got the quote there. Uh, he talked about how species of animals 
could have a few favourable seasons. And in those favourable seasons, they could actually see their numbers grow exponentially. A kind of algae I bloom. The, the irony, the reason why I have the quote from Charles Darwin there is the, the irony is that he was writing just as that algae bloom was actually occurring in his own species. Just as that population boom worldwide was beginning, this population boom which has now slowed down dramatically. It no longer looks like this. This, by the way, is an imaginary made-up country because there's nowhere, there's nowhere that looks like this today, not now. Let's look at a, the opposite extreme. What would slow down, real, real dramatic slowdown look like? Well, it looks like this. Again, we start with 100 million people in 1950, and again, we start with 2% population growth. But then 1951, reduce it to 1.9%, 1952, 1.8%, 1.7%, and so on. So that by 1970, the growth is 0%. It's no longer increasing or decreasing, but then by 1971, it's going down by 10%. Now, that kind of a slowdown initially increases your population up to 120 million people, but then it begins to plummet. It goes down and down and down into a kind of children of men scenario in which the last person is wandering around on their own in 2070 with nobody else to have anybody else with, and that's the end of your population. Same kind of a graph. This is a timeline graph. Same idea. Change on the bottom axis or horizontal axis the actual level you're looking at on the vertical axis. And it lets you see that you've had a great and slowdown. When it moves over to the left-hand side of the screen, to the negative side, then you'll see actual falls. When it's on the right-hand side, you'll see increases and the further to the right, the faster it's increasing. Let's go forward because I've got, I've got about 26 more of these things to show you and less than 26 minutes. We can look at anything. As long as we've got good quality data, we can look at anything on the timeline. Um, and the reason I've called the book Slow Down is because the things I didn't think were slowing down actually turned out to be slowing down. Uh, this is student loans in the United States of America. Still going up, still rising every year. By 2018, latest data I had, uh, 1.5 trillion huge amount of student loans in America. If you think we've got a problem in the UK, and we have, but the US have been lending students money that they'll never be able to pay back uh, for much longer. And that little red dot, you can see it bounces out each October as a new generation of students turn up at university and borrow money to go. And before 2009, before the great financial crash really, really set home, it was rising exponentially. It was moving, curving towards the right, not just getting bigger each year, but getting bigger faster at a faster effort rate. And that cannot carry on forever. And it slowed down. It slowed down from 2009 onwards. And it's still slowing down, still rising, but slowing down. US student debt. People always said that data, the amount of data is accelerating. But when you try and measure it, particularly if you try and measure some data that's useful, the acceleration isn't quite so obvious. Often when something is new, in this case Wikipedia, of course you get acceleration at the beginning. This is the number of entries uh, in Wikipedia. Around about mm, 5 million by 2016, approaching over 6 million probably by about now. And accelerating when Wikipedia was new, to a maximum rate of growth in 2007, and then simply because there are only so many things you can put an entry about, people became bored, it slows down. It's increased again in 2015 because stubs were invented, little subheadings in Wikipedia, but again, it slows down. And it's not just Wikipedia. All the data we have is not increasing exponentially, even even all the selfies we're taking are not increasing exponentially because you cannot keep on taking more selfies even faster than you did the month before. It's not possible. Not everything is slowing down. There are a few things that we measure with high quality data which are accelerating. And one which is absolutely key is our carbon emissions. And again, same graph. But look how it's sloping overall to the right. So it's not just that the carbon emissions are still rising to 35 billion a year by the time of the Paris Agreement. 
it's that they're actually going up faster each year than the year before. And very sadly, every time we have a Rio Agreement in 1992 or Kyoto Protocol in 1997 or the Paris Agreement in 2015, each, each time we think we've done something about it, um, we kind of take our eye off and it accelerates again quickly. It, it reacts best to global recessions. Uh, the recessions in the oil crisis in 1974, but the big recession in the early 80s, we actually see a decrease in, in carbon emissions. Uh, same to recession in the 1990s. If you don't have recessions and you don't do anything else, you don't do enough, then your pollution rises and rises more than before, doubling every 23, every 24 years. It will have slowed down again this year because of the pandemic, but it won't slow down long term unless you do something about it. So emissions is a rare example of something that ha yes, hasn't yet slowed down. Let's go forward. Here's how that graph I've just been showing you, the little red dot you've been following, looks like on a conventional graph. And the reason for showing you this is, is to show you exactly why I draw the timelines in such a convoluted way. Because on a conventional graph, you don't see the, the subtlety of the switches. It just looks like it's going up. You don't notice that, in fact, on a conventional graph, this one starts in 1960. In the 60s, it was increasing quite regularly each year. We know now these are estimates. But by the time it got to the early 80s, it falls. You don't notice the fall, but the fall is important. You need to know it's possible to fall. Conventional graph is easy to understand, but very hard if you're interested in looking at the changes within the changes. It, it really hides those within the graph. Let's go forward and look at temperature, because this is why we're worried about carbon emissions. Now, temperature reacts to, to other things. It's harder to measure. This is a global average. Uh, this is the NASA estimate. It's for a longer time period than, than emissions, and you can see the effects of things like war. But as we head into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, again, you can see the recessions and the Great Recession 2008, 2009. But again, you see it sloping towards the right. So temperature and emissions are not slowing down. The number of people on the planet is slowing down. We're going to move on to that pretty soon. This, by the way, is the most complicated graph. So if you're finding it hard to get your head around these graphs, don't worry. You're not going to be seeing another one with quite as many swirls and spirals as this one in the next quarter of an hour. Population. Now, if you remember that really scary graph of population growing, here you can see a dramatically different graph, and this includes the UN estimates from 2020 onwards. Look at that, population keeps rising after 2020, 8 billion, 9 billion, they think possibly 10 billion, slowing down to 11. The latest estimates, by the way, are lower than this. But look at that curve changing. Instead of rising as it did around about the time that I was born in the late 1960s by an extra 80, billion, 80 million people a year, I was one of those, or by 90, almost 90 million later, rapidly going down to just 60 more million, 50 million, 40 million, only 30 million, only 20 million people a year. Now, other estimates have stability occurring earlier than this, but that is what a slowdown looks like, dramatic slowdown. And all those extra people, by the way, almost all of those extra people are being born and growing up in those parts of the world which emit, emit the least carbon. I'll just let that one run through to 2100 and then we'll move forward and begin to look in more detail at particular parts of the world, but look at them all differently first. Right, the log scale. Why am I showing you it on log scale? Other than I promised to make the graph simpler and I, I haven't. Is to show you that particular events were really important in the history of, of global population. Uh, the two particular events, well, three that are highlighted here. Uh, the first is 1492, and the ships arriving in the Americas and taking the diseases to the Americas. And then you actually see not a decline in world population, but a dramatic slowdown for a century from 1500 to 1600. And that's because of the, the diseases in the Americas. And then from 1820 to 1850, you see another slowdown. Um, that's associated with colonization, the invading by Britain and other European countries of many parts of the world, slowed down population, but then accelerated it as it disturbed all the stable systems, social systems in the world. And so we get our 
population boom, the one, the current one that began around the time of Charles Darwin, and which takes us from just over one billion people to within six or seven generations, almost eight billion people today. And if they were to continue, it would be very scary. But thankfully, since 1968, 69, the rate of growth has been dramatically slowing not due to diseases being introduced as in the Americas, not due to slavery and colonization, but due to people being able to control the number of children they have themselves and feeling secure enough that they can, they can do that. Let's go forward, because you may be thinking, oh, that's true of part of the mob, but is it true? Is it true of everywhere? And this is where recent data is very interesting. Here's China. Well, that's the Opium Wars, by the way. Um, Britain doesn't have a good uh, record when it comes to what we did around the rest of the world. Chinese population, 1968, growing by 20 million a year, one child policy. But in fact, average number of children had fallen from six per family to two before the one child policy. And now, after the policy has been long abandoned, China is still looking at a dramatic slowdown to a billion people, falling to a billion people by the end of this century, within just 80 years of now. And that's without a policy to ensure that that actually happens. And this is one of the key reasons why the world is slowing so abruptly in terms of people. Let's go forward again, look at another part of the world. All of Africa, all the countries of Africa combined. Now, here the projection is for four billion, four and a half billion by the end of the century. But the projections are being disputed, they may not be uh, right, all the new evidence we're getting suggests that things are slowing down faster than this. But if you're wondering why is Africa going from roughly one and a half billion now to four billion, well, one of the reasons you can see it there just in the 1980s and 1990s is that there was an acceleration in population growth. And while there's acceleration in population growth in Africa, it was because of structural adjustments and other programs imposed by the IMF and the World Bank which actually resulted in fewer young children, particularly girls going to school when they're 14, 15, 16, and 17, which results in more children. Let's go forward again. All of India, no one child policy here. And in fact, population control policies really are pretty ineffectual. But already by the year 2000, the slowdown had begun and by 2020, it's well underway. And the projections forward have the whole of the subcontinent of India, of Bangladesh, Pakistan, falling from 2064 onwards. Let's go forward. GDP per capita. Now, if you look at it this way, there is this global GDP per capita, it looks like it's accelerating, and it was accelerating, certainly in the 1950s and 60s, and the 70s and 80s, it slows down a bit. But then by the 90s, you think it was acceleration again, then the great financial crash of 2008, then it zooms out again, but look, since 2006, I think it's leaning that way. And of course, we know what's going to happen after 2018, 2019. We know that global GDP is going to go negative for a year, probably negative further to the right than those dates of 1981, 1990, 2008. So by this way, if you're looking at GDP growth worldwide, the peak growth was 2006, the peak growth year. But I have another way of looking at it. Uh, the other way looks at it on a log scale, and this in terms of is how much are you doubling the size of your economy. And on a log scale, the fastest increase in GDP was in the 1950s, maybe 1964, you can argue about that. But you can see on that graph, you can see the slope, the slope moving towards the point at which we no longer have global, global growth all the time. That's been going on for a lot longer than since 2006. Now, there's a lot of arm waving in my arguments here. But it is absolutely true that the 1950s saw greater average GDP growth than the 1960s, which saw greater growth than the 1970s, which were greater than the 80s, greater than the 90s, and on and on. It's slowing down. Still rising, but slowing. Let's go forward. GDP in China. China, which has some of the highest rates of recent GDP growth. People really worry when it falls just to 6% during a crisis. 2010 may have been the peak growth year. And again, okay, later 2017, 
But as I say, all these graphs were made before the current pandemic, but you can see where they were heading, even if we had not had a pandemic to slow us down even faster than what was occurring already. Let's go forward. Stocks and shares. Now, you can't predict stocks and shares. If you could, you'd made a fortune. And of course, people claim they can. Uh, this is the NASDAQ. These are tech stocks. And this is interesting in a way that these are a few of the stocks in some cases, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, uh, Apple, which have actually done well during the pandemic because people use technology. But look, accelerating to 1996, and we go forward after 1996, what happens? We get a dot com boom, and it looks on this graph like a kind of roller coaster with a double loop. <laughs> We're going around once, crash 2001, 2002. Your high tech stocks are falling. I think they've recovered by 2007, 2008, they crash again. Then they go up and up and up, and you think, oh, look, look how much money we've made if you kept on investing in the NASDAQ. It slows down again, 2019. No portent of what was going to happen. Um, but, you know, gives you an idea of the kind of roller coaster ride of stocks and shares. Things that are more predictable. Uh, adult heights. Adult heights were accelerating uh, by, you know, more than a tenth of a centimetre a year, all the way worldwide this is, for most of the last century. And then they don't rise so fast. Now, they're not actually falling. Uh, what's happening is the global average height is falling because the mix of who lives in the world is falling. Uh, so the populations of countries where people are shorter is rising faster than where people are taller. But within every country, the height of human beings is no longer rising as fast, which suggests that we're kind of approaching a slower change. Again, think about your great 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 grandparents, your grandparents, your parents, and your generation. Think of the average height. Think of going to university graduations, if you do that. Uh, the thing that most interests me about university graduations is how much taller, on average, the graduates are than their parents. How many inches? Now, we know we've controlled for all other kinds of things. Same social class, same background, same um, parts of the world or country that they come from. Uh, but traditionally, younger people became taller uh, than their parents within the last 100 years. That change, that change is coming to an end. Graduates. Temperature still accelerating because emissions still accelerating. The third thing which is still accelerating or was a number of international uh, graduates studying in the globe and going up to about 35% of people being at university uh, in recent years. Now, of course, this probably has slowed down with the pandemic but it's going to have to slow down anyway because it, it can't get to 100%. So it just shows how rare this kind of an increase is. It doesn't go on forever. But I wanted to show you all the things that I could measure where we had good quality data, where there was still an acceleration of graduates of the third one. So you have to think, what, what's the fourth one going to be? What's the, the, the last thing that is actually or was still accelerating when I tried to measure Maybe almost a thousand different things that we had good quality global data for. Let's go forward. It wasn't species extinction. Species extinction has actually been decelerating since 1984. Uh, this is the worst scenario in the estimates of the number of species. Uh, these are larger species that are extinct. Uh, but by 2013, by this measure, 70% have become extinct. Uh, this isn't great news, of course, and the fact it's decelerating isn't great news. If it hadn't decelerated, we'd all be dead, because it would have hit 100% of the species, large species, uh, being extinct. Why the greatest peaks in the 1980s? Because that's where, in the last very rare species on particular islands, we were recording that they were being wiped out. Um, currently, in uh, the decade we've just left, Covering around about zero, people are trying very hard to avoid the extinction at least of, of larger, larger species that are measured. So it's not that which is accelerating. So what can it be? Flights. The number of flights people are taking. Now look at it going up and up and up. By the time of the Twin Towers, it was almost 2 billion, 2 billion a year. 
by the time we get to 2012, it's 3 billion a year. And not just rising. 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. Not just more people flying each year, but even more than the year before. It's completely out of control. And importantly, these 4 billion people who are flying a year, they weren't 4 billion different people. They're people like you. Uh, certainly people like me. People flying several times a year. The majority of people in the world never fly, never will fly. More and more people are born every year who will never fly. So the flying and the pollution that causes is due to a small number of people. And that was the fourth thing that was still accelerating. And of course, you know, flying has absolutely collapsed in 2020. And hopefully, hopefully we'll never, I am optimistic, never reach this level again because it's going to become much more expensive to fly when you don't have a large number of people willing to pay to fly. And that alone may, if we're lucky, deter this from rising up again. And maybe the fear, the fear of flying, not because of the fear of accidents, the fear of what you might catch on the plane, or what might happen if you're trapped somewhere, or the fear of what was the point of that journey? Was it really that necessary? Was that holiday actually that good? Anyway. Flying is the fourth and the last thing that I measured that was actually accelerating. Everything else, although often still rising, is slowing down. And this has really interesting repercussions. Uh, the human repercussions, I think, are the most important of all. We really can stop worrying about having more and more babies. We were having more and more babies in the past, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, not because the fertility rate was increasing, but because there were more people who were the right age to have babies. But then, and this is worldwide, in the 90s, you see, actually fall down. Okay, and it's just sort of zooming around a steady state, 135 million babies a year, and then plummets, plummets down to 125 uh, by the end of this century. By which time we'll have more people dying than the number of babies being born. And for the first time in the history of the human species, we will have a particular kind of stability that we've never had before. We've only seen global population fall before in the times of huge pandemic, in the times of world war, in the times of diseases being brought to whole new areas of the planet by people moving around. Not this kind of steady, steady state, steady, steadying down that is going on at the moment. And there is the projection forward. The only reason, by the way, it rises by the late 1980s and then 2000s is the grandchildren of the baby boom post-war. Life expectancy. Still rising, but since 1966, since our greatest achievements at, at reducing infant mortality back then, the rise has been slowing down worldwide. And again, you see an improvement from 1992 to 2010. Part of that actually was, was AIDS, I mean, better treatments for AIDS. Uh, but there, there's the projections. And I don't believe these projections from 2020 onwards. These are World Bank projections and they just go up too fast. Uh, so the data to date suggests that life expectancy, while still rising worldwide, and look, it's, you know, reached almost 73 years, it's probably not going to rise as fast as it rose in the time of our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents. Only a few more slides to go, just two or three, so don't worry, we're going to get to a conclusion. This is the last graph uh, in the book, Slow Down. And it's there partly because this way of graphing data uh, was invented uh, not by me, uh, but actually by Japanese social scientists who used it for what is quite an obscure purpose uh, to try to measure the extent to which cities in Japan were suburbanizing or whether the growth was concentrating in the urban core. And this is the graph for uh, Tokyo and in the 1930s and 40s and 50s you can see it swinging around wildly as you go from growth in the centre to growth in the suburbs to growth in the centre again but over time and towards the present it begins to settle down in the centre because a city like Tokyo is beginning to not change it's beginning to become stable total population beginning not to increase at least certainly not as fast as fast as almost any other city in the planet. 
incredibly low fertility rate, 1.3 babies per couple, and an infrastructure that is settling down. You know, this is what the shape of the city will be in future. It's not going to increase in population by 25%. It's not going to double. Not going to shrink. It doesn't need to shrink as long as people are allowed into Japan. Um, it's becoming stable. And that's what slowdown is suggesting. Many, many aspects of life, how our cities are, how much we consume, how we study, are stabilizing, whereas before they were accelerating and it made it much harder to see what was coming. This isn't an end of history. There'll be other aspects of life which do change more quickly, things that we don't currently measure, probably things about our relationships. I end the book talking about the Japanese royal family because the man who first used this graph in Japan, his daughter married into the Japanese royal family and for the first time in millennia was not a member of the aristocracy. So social norms, conventions, they may well change faster than before, but because we don't measure them quantitatively, it's very hard to know. My conclusions. Coming in a second. These diagrams, where do they come from? Uh, they, they come from physics. They come from looking at the damping of a spring. And they come from looking at the pendulum and how a pendulum slows down. And here you can see a normal picture of a pendulum swinging from side to side, less and less. And on the diagram, it's called the phase diagram in physics, you can see it spiraling around to the centre. So this isn't a particularly new technique, but we have social science data now of such high quality that we can apply it to social science and see the same kind of thing happening. The end of the Great Acceleration. More time. No need to go so fast. No need, no need to aim higher, get bigger, innovate more, produce more inventions. The 1930s saw the greatest rate of invention. 1950s saw the greatest economic growth. Growth can be very, very useful, but clearly, obviously, the planet cannot continue to cope with human beings, especially in the most affluent parts of the world seeing growth at the level that they have. And the fact that that growth has been slowing down for decades and decades, I think is something certainly worth welcoming. This doesn't say that there will not be other changes. Of course there will be. But it does say that in terms of material well-being, in terms of the amount of space we have, in terms of what we produce, what we consume, how far and fast we travel, my generation, and my children's generation and their children's generation are likely to have much more in common with each other than my generation had with my parents and my grandparents. And that we should welcome because we really, really do need to slow down. Thank you very much for listening. And we're back and live with our speaker, Danny Dorling. Welcome back, Danny. Hi there. Pity we can't be in person, um, but we have some wonderful questions coming in already from your, um, from your lecture. Uh, the first one is from Chris, who asks via email, what impact do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will have on the predictions made in your book? Um, I think things are still going to carry on uh, slowing down. Of course, what the pandemic did is suddenly slow down uh, even the things which were accelerating, like air, like air flights and so on. Um, but I don't think the pandemic is going to say result in a baby boom and an acceleration. I suspect its effects may not be as enormous as we think they will be, but this pandemic will still have larger effects than um, the last five or, or six pandemics had, um, partly because how we've uh, reacted uh, to it uh, and it, it might help us adjust to slow down a bit more easily um, see slow down as inevitable work out that we are going to have a world with less material resources speeding up than before and then we have to share things out 
uh, much better than before. And if we want to say, oh, it's because of the pandemic that we worked it out, that's that's good enough. I, I happen to think it was inevitable anyway. One of the things that come across in the book is, I mean, not cynicism, but there's a there's a world weariness almost to predictions and how things are exaggerated. I mean, is this something which you feel we may have exaggerated its impact? Uh, well, yes, the impact's very large on us. Um, the, it's countries with an elderly population who are most affected by the pandemic. Um, they are the affluent countries of the world. And of course, not all countries with an elderly uh, population. China has a pretty elderly population. Um, in most of the world, uh, this pandemic is minor compared to what people are actually suffering from. Uh, the infectious diseases in parts of Africa, uh, malaria is killing far more people um, than COVID, for instance, in, in many places. Uh, but it really matters to us, and of course it matters to us in the, in the UK more than anybody else in Europe, um, because we did have the most uh, severe pandemic and we have this kind of yo-yoing now where um, government introduces a different strategy every week, so the three weeks ago, you know, and we'll never know whether it was because they did that three weeks ago or so on. Um, but, but you've got to remember, you've got to step yourself out from the UK. We're not as odd as the USA, which is a really strange country right now. But we are a particularly dislocated place. There's nowhere else in Europe that's facing Brexit, for instance. There's nowhere else in Europe that's seen a GDP drop that we've seen. It's, you know, so I know it is a bit disconcerting to be in Britain at the moment, but it is not a good, good guide to kind of global trends of what is happening. Uh, we are in a particular time of particular dislocation where it can seem as if everything is up in the air. But that really is a very British, a very English a very now, a very 2020 thing. Mm. Um, you Ted was saying before your lecture how prolific you've been. Um, one of the questions has, uh, what inspired you to write this book now or uh, last year, I assume you wrote it? I, I, I suspect I got addicted to writing books um, because I found it quite hard um, writing originally. I, I did my PhD at Newcastle uh, and I had to do seven uh, drafts. I, th I didn't actually realise it was only after my PhD that somebody told me I was dyslexic, which which might help. Um, but then once you're allowed to write a book and people read it, it, it does become addictive. Mm -hmm. I began writing this one about seven years ago now. Um, and it's the freedom. Uh, there's a great difference between books and academic papers. I write very few academic papers now. Uh, because they're short and you can't really say what you want because the referees won't let you do that and they won't publish the paper. Whereas the nice thing about a book, as long as you're careful, but you can actually say genuinely uh, what you what you believe is, is the case in the book. Um, but with the pandemic, I've actually slowed down on, on books. So, and I've realised I, I was addicted to certain things and one of them was I always had to have another book I was writing. Living your research. Um, next, another question. In your opinion, what is the one measurable metric that is best to use as a general marker for acceleration? Oh, for whether we have acceleration. Um, the best is probably the boring one of our actual numbers uh, of how many people there are um, on the planet, particularly young people. Uh, so it's, it's not that exciting, um, but it's when we see human population slowing that other things, and particularly the way capitalism works, um, capitalism really only works when you have an, a market which is growing, and that essentially is more people. Um, it's not about more people being richer. You can only wear one shirt at a time. But if there are more people being born who are going to buy more shirts and you produce shirts, then odds on, even if you don't do any, anything particularly innovative, your business should grow. And um, this breaks the recent government rules about what we're not allowed to teach. I don't know if they affect universities, but certainly if you're a school child, you have to stop listening now. But, you know, capitalism basically doesn't work in the long term. It's not sustainable. Uh, what, what I think I've seen signs of, and many other people have, is that it changes actually a bit more slowly. This slowdown, when you look at it, it had to slow down. You can't have everything accelerating all the time. So of course it is when you look at the data. The irony is that we have this rhetoric 
uh, of it's always getting faster all the time. And I think that really does come from my grandparents' time when it was true. And it's a very comforting thing because I am feeling stressed. It's really hard because the world's changing so fast. Um, whereas in fact, you're feeling so stressed because we're not organizing our world very well. It isn't changing uh, that fast. The, you know, the new forms of transport are not that amazing compared to what they were in the past. It's just that we've set things up in such a way that they're not satisfactory. And because we're not accelerating, we can't say, oh, don't worry, just around the corner in 10 or 20 years time, there'll be new nanotechnologies or something else that means that all your worries will go away. You know, we're beginning to realise that isn't on the cards. I was struck this morning with the last British Airways 747s taking off the retirement of after 50 years. Yes. Yeah, and um, it's amazing to, to read about the tests. I think I have them in the book. Um, the test flights were 1968. So... so 1970, I think, is the first time that they decided that passengers could actually go on these en en enormous planes. Um, and, you know, that is, that is, in 1968, 1970, that was quite remarkable. And what's also remarkable is 1968, 1970 was the peak growth of human beings. It was 2.1% compound growth of people uh, a year. Uh, there are an enormous number of things that, peaked around that time and of course 1968 is also when the population bomb book was published um it, it's um odd to think how long it takes us how long how the lag between something slowing down and an acceptance uh that this kind of slowdown appears to be inevitable also the year of the the moonrise photograph from Apollo 8, bringing everything in perspective. Um, mm. This question we'll put on the spot. How can we use this data on acceleration to our advantage as a human population? Oh, um, that does put me on the spot. What, well, I think we could do things like we could look at the flight data. You know, I, I showed you the graph of the number of flights accelerating and four billion, not people, but flights being taken. And you could look at that and say, that was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and of course, we're now currently facing the issue of uh, the 747 being decommissioned four years early, enormous job losses in the, in the flight industry, but huge drops in flights, presumably big increases in the price of air tickets in future that should reduce the number of people flying, but also some questioning. I mean, in the short term, the, the most dangerous thing you can touch at the moment in the world is a, is a lock on the toilet door in an airplane. Uh, I, th I think, um, don't quote me on this, but uh, I have actually written one paper, a paper with some colleagues, Chinese colleagues, um, about business travellers and who most likely transmitted this disease. Uh, people who go on planes are more likely to integrate with other people and, and to be dangerous. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, in terms of an example of how we can use this information sensibly, you could just look at that graph of flights going up and you could say, it was going to slow down one way or another in the next few years for a reason. You absolutely couldn't have predicted this would be the reason. It could have been a huge increase in the price of oil in three years' time due to some war. It could have been anything. But it had to be something, because accelerations cannot uh, go on forever. And then you need to begin to say things such as, well, how can business work without people flying to New York? Now, we've actually learned that recently. Uh, but also, how can you be happy without flying somewhere warm in January? Now, of course, most people can't fly on a holiday in January, but it, but it, all these questions of um, how to live a happy life and a better life with less flights uh, matter. And they're not easy uh, because travel really does matter. Uh, you can get young people to give up driving. You can give, well, we'll never take it up because uh, so many don't pass a driving test and not have a car. What you can't do is get people not to be adventurous and want to explore and want to travel. So that question about flights, you have to substitute flying, or at least flying in that way of airplanes, with some other way of being curious and moving around that wasn't quite so out of control and, and quite as destructive. Uh, so, so that's an example. But, but in general, um, when you're promised enormous change to come in the future, just be really skeptical about it. Uh, when you're told that your children will be much better off because they'll be in the world of gadgets, 
um, those gadgets won't necessarily be that different. Uh, when I was a student in Newcastle, there was Professor B. Sag, a statistician, uh, who was writing papers. I was a very nerdy student, which is obvious. Um, was writing papers on pattern recognition uh, and the analysis of pictures. Uh, and th this is 19, uh, 1986 to 89. Um, and, and basically based in stats that would let you recognize things, images, so you can recognize number plates or recognize faces as we do now, or recognize voices, recognize sounds, and you get Alexis and so on. Um, so all that stuff that we're told is incredibly new and innovative actually was being done a long time ago. The 80s were a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And although in universities, we have to kind of say, look how much we're doing, look how much we're inventing, look how much we're discovering. You know, sadly, the speed of discovery was faster in the past with far fewer people doing research because there were more things to be newly discovered with the new techniques uh, that came along in the new machinery. Now, and it's it's almost a taboo to say, um, particularly in, we've got a thing called the research assessment exercise where we all have to claim to be producing stellar four-star discoveries, right? And so it's so a long-winded answer to the question, but at least we can begin to not carry this ridiculous, you know, fantasy on that people in universities, each individually are producing more discoveries of greater value at an intergalactic level of cleverness than has ever happened before. You know, that has got to stop. Today's word. Um, AC asks, hi Danny, do you have any opinions on the role of social impact bonds? as a means to nudge investors towards more desirable social outcomes. Will they affect anywhere near enough to change? Uh, yeah, social impact bonds. I'm, okay, I'm a, I'm a bit of a lefty, so I'm a bit of a skeptic on, on these. Um, because underlying the rationale of the social impact bond is still the idea that somebody's going to make some money, otherwise they wouldn't invest in the bond. Or, for instance, the pension scheme wouldn't invest, you know, our pension scheme the biggest private pension scheme in Britain, the USS, you know, it wouldn't invest in social impact bonds if it didn't think it's going to get enough money to pay the pensions. So the real motivation won't necessarily be social. Now, you may say you can de devise a series of measurements whereby the bond only gives you enough money if you solve, say, homelessness, which this government has suggested social impact bonds um, could be used to solve homelessness. Alternatively, you can look at those countries in Europe which have largely solved homelessness, of which the premier one is Finland, and they didn't do it with social impact bonds. So it's an American idea. It's the idea of doing good with large amounts of money. People who've got a lot of money doing good, I'm afraid when I look at geographical differences across the planet, those countries where a few people don't have a lot of money, like the Scandinavian countries, do far better. And those countries where money is concentrated in a few hands, like the USA and the UK, it, life is not good for a lot of people. They have the highest rates of poverty. So I'm a skeptic on social impact bonds. Um, I'm glad I haven't been asked this question. Um, do you feel once acceleration slows, we will have a new baseline, a plateau or period of deceleration, and that long-term we will experience a cyclical model of acceleration and deceleration? <laughs> I have no idea. No, I can be honest. There's no reason why I should have any idea. Um, and I'll tell you why of no idea. We can't even do this backwards in time. Uh, so um, if you look at, say, Thomas Piketty's description of inequality over time, he kind of says it was very high and then we had this brief period of low inequality and then up again. But other people disagree. Uh, I've seen data showing up and down and that's about the past. Now, if we don't even know about, about the past, um, we, we don't know about um, the far future on this, but I I think it is not unreasonable to say that what we've just lived through has been odd. Uh, the fastest acceleration in the history of people on the planet, the biggest increase in our numbers in the shortest amount of time, nothing like uh, the various uh, farming revolutions that took 40 or 100 generations to be written about and went away. This industrial revolution, this world capitalism, uh, thing occurred in an incredibly short amount of time and it's hard to see that happening at least for several dozen generations as quickly again but you can't you can't predict uh, 
the future, but you can at least far better interpret your presence and just say, it doesn't look like this when you when you measure it, which is all I've really done. And, and the only reason I've got some confidence in this is that it wasn't what I was expecting to find. I wasn't confirming my own prejudices. Uh, I was actually trying to find what is speeding up and what is slowing down. And I kept on looking for the speeding up and I kept on asking people to give me suggestions. Um, I just thought I was being lazy or made a mistake. Uh, and eventually I realized, of course, hardly anything actually is accelerating at any one time. But more things were accelerating in the recent past. And our last audience question comes from SilverDM123, who asks, given the acceleration of technology, uh, Moore's law, do you think this will have an increased deacceleration of human endeavor as machines take over? Uh, well, I mean, Moore's law is curving slightly. There are lots of debates about this, uh, but much more importantly, uh, the, the things that we put these extremely fast computer chips to are not as impressive as, as, as what we used to. Um, so when I, again, I was sitting as a student in my, in my room in Newcastle in the 1980s, and I had a little computer um, with a 16K memory, you know, we really made use of it, in, you know, incredible uh, uh, use of it. Um, I can remember being allowed to use 280 magnetic tapes in the bottom of Claremont Tower. Um, so I won't rattle on about this, but um, the way we waste what we have now. Uh, I'm very skeptical in the book. I talk about the four artificial intelligence revolutions of my lifetime. Four times uh, people have said artificial intelligence is just about to take over uh, since I was a child. Uh, so it's a kind of, you know, I am skeptical when I am middle-aged and we get like this at this age. Uh, but I, and again, it, it fits back to Julian B. Sykes' pattern recognition. Most of the artificial intelligence that really impresses us um, being able to talk to a machine in our kitchen and it answers and so on, it's not actually artificial intelligence, it's a form of pattern recognition. Uh, there could become a scary moment when the machines do do something scary. I have not uh, yet seen it. And it, it's that which, which holds me back. And also, we, we need to be clever about what we're trying to put these things to. Uh, one good example is automated cars. Um, you know, we could design a world in which people are driving around in cars that drive them, in traffic jams which are enormous, where they get no exercise. And that might be ever so clever for the people who work out how a car can drive itself, but it might not increase aggregate human happiness. Uh, understanding aggregate human happiness and morals and so on. Uh, every so often I ask Alexa, uh, what is the right thing to do in this situation, just for a joke, to see what she says? Uh, and, you know, the answer to the question, what is the right thing to do in this situation? Uh, that is a long, long, long away from where we are with artificial intelligence. I don't mean to end on a, on a, a low point, but one of the things that come across in the book as well is, is worry and fear. And I wonder, since um, you're doing an epilogue, I think, for the new edition, uh, how much that's been a feature of 2020 and how you would map that or think of that in historical context? Uh, yes, I'm do doing adding an epilogue for, for, for an edition coming out in January, which, which will be about the pandemic. Uh, we are a worrying species. Uh, we, we really are. Uh, we're very good at tossing up the number of things that might end us. Um, you know, I, I remember once counting up 44 possible uh, ways in which human species might be ended that people had, had come up with. And this isn't particularly new, although, you know, we're better now than in the past. But in the past, we were constantly talking about the end of times and what might bring it about. Uh, we worry personally. Um, we worry in, in our social lives. Uh, only the naked mole rat is as sociable as us, apparently, in, in terms of being a, a creature that, that uh, in terms of mammals, that depend so much on other mammals. And we really worry about what other people think about us. We're stuck with that in our biology, but that should, that should hopefully be helpful as we create new problems for ourselves, which are aggregate at the level of the planet, which you couldn't imagine. Um, it, telling people not to worry their little heads about this. Don't worry, it'll go away. The great politicians will sort it. For a worrying mammal, 
uh, that won't work. And I, and I think that's quite um, good news. I think I think the way that human beings worry, I have a chapter at the beginning called, called to worry imaginatively. Uh, if we were much more blasé, and of course we vary, you know, some people do worry much more than others. But if we were more gung-ho and blasé as a species, we could far faster head down uh, mm. the route towards unsustainability uh, than the worrying species. Now you may say, but we're doing terrible, terrible things uh, to the planet. It takes a whole generation to change opinions. This, this is one thing. And so one tiny thing I have in the book, I wish I'd done more on, uh, is uh, the fear I had when I was a student at Newcastle. Um, I arrived in 1986, two years earlier, the atomic clock had been at three minutes to midnight. Uh, atomic war was, nuclear war was seen as the most likely thing uh, to happen as a film based on Sheffield called Fred. We thought we were all going to die in nuclear Armageddon. Uh, and within my lifetime, we've reduced the number of nuclear missiles on the planet tenfold. Still a threat, uh, but at the time of Ronald Reagan, who was president then, we just thought it was absolutely impossible. Now, disarming nuclear weapons is far easier than worrying about the effects of species extinction and accelerating temperature rises. But we did actually do it. But it was a new generation who did it. And it was the generation who grew up believing that this was the most important problem that did it. And that, that's why I have an optimism. The pessimism, of course, is the next thing is always something you never imagined. Uh, nobody in 1900 imagined nuclear war. Hardly anybody imagined global climate change. We find them now, but they really, really didn't. I was taught at school before, before coming to Newcastle that the Ice Age was coming. And uh, Newcastle geography, I was not taught about global warming because it wasn't known uh, then in, in the department. So if you want to just not worry, but you know, worry imaginatively, in 50 years time, there will be a huge problem. And it will be something that nobody at the moment is worrying about at all. There was a kernel of hope in there, which I will extract <laughs> yes. uh, as we approach the autumn of our year. Um, yes. At this point, I will turn to the audience in the Coastal Auditorium in the Herschel building, which you remember well, yes. and ask them to thank you for a wonderful and stimulating lecture, but I can't, so I'll do it myself. Thank you very much, Danny Dorling. Thank you ever so much for having me. Thank you. And if I could just give a bit of a business for our audience, uh, our next event was meant to be Adam Gridley uh, speaking on, as an expert by experience, speaking on the Tuesday, the 13th of October next week. That's had to be rescheduled. So Adam Gridley will now be on the 5th of November, bonfire night, Thursday, the 5th of November, rather than Tuesday, the 13th of October, which means our next event will be Joanna Burke speaking on a global history of sexual violence next Thursday, uh, 15th of October at half past five, as usual. Thank you very much for your questions. I hope to see you then.